Hello and welcome to this presentation. Today we will be discussing the cloud security project from Zach Romano, Matt Vanderpoel, and me, Jen Windsor. For our project, we created a capture the flag nifty assignment based around election security as it relates to cloud computing. Let's get started. So here's a quick overview of this presentation, but I'd like to jump right into our motivation. So let's go. Throughout the semester, we've seen several security vulnerabilities and exploits against cloud computing. But something we, that we haven't looked into as much are vulnerabilities that are entirely preventable by the cloud consumer. So cloud service providers offer security configuration options like firewalls, secure keys, identity and access management controls, and these all provide a first line of defense against intrusion. But in 2019, we saw companies misconfigure all of these. So in July, we all heard about the Capital One breach. This affected millions of people and revealed bank account numbers, social security numbers, and credit card applications. This was all caused by a misconfigured firewall on an AWS server. And in October, Imperva, which is a security vendor, said that hackers stole an administrative AWS private key that was exposed due to a misconfiguration. And then the attackers used that to lift and access a database snapshot of user records. And then in November, researchers revealed that True Dialog, which is a business SMS solutions provider, had exposed at least 604 gigabytes of data on an unsecured Microsoft, Microsoft Azure database. Um, this included tens of millions of text messages and other private information. So private consumer data is usually the biggest victim of a cloud security misconfiguration, which is bad enough, but a lot of the stakes were even higher. Cloud service providers like Amazon have been offering their resources to governments for voter registration and vote tabulation since at least 2019. But secret ballots are crucial to ensuring fair elections and voter registration data contains some especially sensitive private information. To add on to all that, a 2020 poll showed that a majority of Americans already mistrust the integrity of US elections. So failures in configuration of election related cloud resources could damage that faith even further. So it's really important that we get this right. Now imagine that you're a student wanting to learn more about cloud security and the potential pitfalls for companies and individuals such as you, and you want to configure a cloud environment. Or imagine that you're a college instructor teaching students about this. Where can you go for resources? So Udemy and Coursera have some resources, um, but they are not as in-depth on the security part of cloud computing and are definitely not hands-on. Then even the principles of cloud computing course that Johns Hopkins offers doesn't even touch on security until the final module and goes against best practices for the rest of the class by having students use the root user on AWS. So our project is motivated by these questions. Are cloud security resources resilient enough to support a high stakes situation like an election? What are the common pitfalls in cloud configuration and web app configuration as it relates to cloud computing? More so, how can we teach these concepts in an engaging and fun way? So keep these questions in the back of your mind throughout. Now I'll turn it over to Zach to address some background on the project. Hey everyone, I'm Zach Romano and I'll give a little bit of background on Capture the Flag now. So when I say Capture the Flag, you probably think of the childhood game where one team is defending a flag and the other team has to break through their, their barrier and grab the flag and return home safely, right? So in terms of cybersecurity, it's very similar to that. One team has their application and they're trying to defend it and the other team is trying to break through their security, their firewalls, whatever and steal their flags or find their hints, exploit their vulnerabilities. So it, it, it's very similar to that. And what, what's great about this, if you're a person like me that uh, kind of learns by doing rather than you know, reading, reading papers or you know, watching lectures, this is a very interactive way to learn cybersecurity. Um, so it's, it's very great for you know, institutions to implement these and they can have their employees learn cybersecurity in a hands-on way. The problem with these is that the, the vulnerabilities that people typically include in their capture the flag activities, their applications, are typically very hard to find. They're you know, very obscure. They don't want a lot of people to be able to complete their capture the flag. That's part of the challenge for them. So this creates a pretty large barrier to entry and 
results in not a lot of people wanting to do capture the flag exercises because they just simply don't know how. So part of what this project serves to do is get people interested in capture the flags exercises, get people you know doing hands-on activities with cybersecurity, and get more people interested in the the field of cybersecurity, and hopefully improve cybersecurity for organizations. So now you might ask, what skills are required for taking part in this capture the flag activity? Well, this was designed for intro-level cybersecurity students or intro-level hobbyists. So the only things that you really might want to know are the relationship between a client, a server, and a cloud provider. That's really all you need to know. Knowing the basics of how a web applications might help, but is certainly not required for this activity. For the design of our capture the flag exercise, we decided to model it after a fake voting system. So you can think of a local town is trying to hold an election and they want to host it online because of COVID. Everyone's at home. They don't want to go to the polling station and risk getting COVID. So the, the goal of the attacker here is to go in and change the outcome of the election. And in order to do that, they're going to have to exploit some of the OAuth top 10 vulnerabilities. So if you're not familiar with OAuth, uh, you should definitely Google it. It's the top 10 vulnerabilities that occur in web application or in cloud applications. So after exploiting these vulnerabilities, the attacker will be granted access to an admin screen that they're not supposed to see where they can log votes from fake mail-in ballots. So how do we measure the success of this project? For us, the primary goal here is education, right? We want to teach students or teach hobbyists, whoever, about capture the flag activities, how fun they can be, and really our, our main goal here is to get them interested in the field of cybersecurity. So we, you know, we wanna bring the, whole, the field up as a whole, get everyone interested in cybersecurity. As for the students, we measure their success by two things, the time it takes for them to complete the activity and the number of bugs they find. So we will rate everyone on how, how long it took them and we'll give them all a score based on how many vulnerabilities they were able to find or how far, in the, how far along they were able to get minus the number of hints that they had to request. So any user that gets stuck can request a hint using our, our hint system, and hopefully that will help them move further along and learn more about these types of vulnerabilities. All right, so now I'm gonna do a quick demonstration of our application. So since our application is hosted on AWS, anyone can access it by going to the link below. So once you click on that link, you'll be prompted with our homepage here. So this is the, the homepage for the Capture the Flag exercise, and it gives you a little bit of background on what you're supposed to do. So it says, for this exercise, you're putting yourself in the shoes of an attacker. There's an election coming up, and the local government has decided to go with an online voting platform. So you need to break into the online voting platform and change the election to result in your favor. So it also gives a little bit of reading material on the types of vulnerabilities you'll be looking for, a link to the election website that you're actually going to try to attack, and it offers a few hints should you get stuck. So we're going to click here and go to the election website. So once on the election website, we can see that it says welcome voters, and there's two options here. We can either try to log in or we can click on forgot username. So we can click log in and we're prompted with a username and password, but we don't know that, so our best bet is to go back. Maybe we click on forgotten username. So once we're here, we don't really know what to search for, but maybe we just try searching for um, something random. Maybe we just go with the, the default that they have there is uh, user123. So unfortunately, it looks like there aren't any results for that. So maybe we go back and we can try to think of other ideas of things to search for. So maybe we try to be a little bit malice here. Maybe we try to just break their election by dropping their tables. So we know they're searching. This is a search based on a string. So we might try putting an end quote here and maybe a, a semicolon and then say uh, drop table. And it's probably named users since the search is for users and we click search, and okay, it looks like they actually have a little bit of alerting here. So it says, looks like you might be trying to modify the database, you could be arrested for hacking. So in a real world situation, you know, this might alert the authorities and say, hey, this person is trying to break into your system, um, you know, go, go after them. 
So we'll come back and maybe we'll try to do something a little bit less, less, less intrusive, less likely to get caught. So maybe we'll just try to see if we can see a, a list of all of their users. So we'll come back here, we'll delete this, and we'll just say or a equals uh, a. All right, so that works. So while you can't modify the database, you can search and find all of the results in this user table. So we can see there are 303 uh, registered voters in here. And what's really interesting is kind of these, these top three here. Um, so there's, there's one named user, admin, and dev. And th those kind of seem like administrative accounts. They don't really seem like real, real people like Miki here. So what we can do now is maybe, maybe we just try to log in as this, this user. So we can come back here, or we can actually click login right here. So we know their username is user, but we don't know what their password is. So maybe we just try password, try a few common ones. That's not right. Maybe it's just user user. Ah, it is. So now we're logged in as the user. So we can see we have the option here that we can vote either a Democrat or a Republican. Um, so, I mean, we can maybe sway the ballot by one person by just coming and voting here. Ah, looks like they're not allowed to vote twice. So that doesn't really, that doesn't really help us. So maybe we can go back and well, we can see the URL that it's slash user and we know that there was an admin account too. So maybe we come here and we just say, okay, maybe slash admin. Oh, look at that. All right, so now we're prompted with this admin page. So it looks like they have some broken authentication here. Now what we can do is we can kind of look at this page. You can see the vote count. Um, you can also see down here, there's something interesting. It says developers, if you've forgotten your login credentials, they are stored in credentials.txt. Well, where could credentials.txt be? Um, you know, maybe we can try copying that and just pasting that up here. But that just gives us their 404 page, nothing interesting. Um, but maybe, maybe we look at this image. And so we can inspect this image and we can see, oh, this is coming from an S3 bucket. So what if we, what if we copy the URL of their, their S3 bucket? So it looks like the root of their S3 bucket is, um, has access controls on it, but what if we try credentials.txt? Ah, aha, we can see there's a username and password. So we see that dev username and we see their password. Uh, that is, I'm a very bad developer, which makes sense. So now we can go back, we can log out as the admin and we can log in as the developer and paste that password in. Aha, so now we're logged in as the developer. We can see that the developer has permission to submit a mail-in ballot. That makes sense, right? Because some people mail their ballot in. So we can see that we can select their vote option here, but we can only do it for one user. So now we kind of need, we, we can try typing in a user here. So maybe we just try typing Zach and see what happens. Ah. So we see that user does not exist. So we can't just make up people here, it seems. So what if we come back and we get our list of, our list of all of our users? So maybe we duplicate this tab, uh, we log out, and we go back to the home page. So we can come back, we can do our SQL injection again here. All right, so now we have our list of users again. So maybe we just copy a random one here. So we can copy uh, Tisha here and we can go back and we can paste that one in and we can vote and see if we see that, see if it works. So we submit this vote and all right, it seems like it might've worked. So um, maybe, maybe we do one or two more just to, to be sure. So we can vote another one and all right, so we, the developer can't see who is 
winning the election, so maybe we come back and we try to see if they have access to the admin screen, which they do. So now if we look at the counts again, we can see that we, we have actually changed the, changed the outcome of the election at this point. So we have, we have completed the mission. We have hacked into the system. It doesn't appear like they have any sort of accounting for this. So uh, our mission is complete. Hello, everyone. My name is Matt Vanderpoel, and I will going, be going over the results of our challenge. Six fictitious individuals were identified to participate in our challenge. We decided to organize these individuals into teams, into three different teams. The teams were then presented with a pre-CTF challenge questionnaire that asked such questions as age, gender, education. We also asked them about their experience with cloud computing, SQL, and web applications. The graphs to the right show the results of the age and experience level. You can see that all had some college with some containing advanced degrees. And some individuals rated their experience with web applications and cloud environments as above average. We then started the challenge. As previously mentioned, we kept track of time each team took, the number of hints requested, and the number of exploits obtained. Our challenge had a total of five exploits, each worth 20%, and we deducted 10% for each hint requested. We put a time limit on each team as two, uh, two hours. The table to the right summarizes the results of our challenge. Two teams successfully completed the challenge and one team did not need any hints. One team required three hints, but was still able to successfully complete the challenge. And one team was not able to complete it in the allotted two hours. Finally, we asked all challenge participants to complete an exit questionnaire. The questionnaire focused on the learning factor of the experiment with cloud computing and cybersecurity. It also asked them to rate their experience with the challenge. Did they have fun while they were learning? The graphs to the right show the results of the questionnaire for learning and fun. All teams rated their experience of clouds and cybersecurity as high after completing our challenge. They also enjoyed the challenge and would recommend to others. An interesting outcome in the results is the team's thoughts on electronic voting. Originally, we had two teams which thought it could be conducted safely. After our experiment, we only had one. We believe this shows how our experiment has helped others learn about these vulnerabilities, which could exist if electronic voting is conducted in the cloud. This is Jen again. So now that we've gone through the nifty assignment itself, let's talk about some ways that we could expand and improve it in the future. First, we could improve portability with containerization. Our project uses an in-memory database, so as it is now, we could reset pretty easily if a student's SQL injection attack were to go awry, for instance. Um, but this could be expanded, and then we could make the system more portable and easier to deploy and scale. Um, and one example of some way that we would do that is with Docker containerization. Next is metrics. We came up with a pretty primitive solution for tracking student performance. That is the Google Forms to track when students request hints. Um, this solution would be tough to scale though, and just generally we would like something more elegant for a long-term solution. So in the future, we would like to implement a robust tracking system to follow student actions, what they're trying, how long it takes them to either get past vulnerability or get stuck um, and have some sort of login with that. And then this next point relates to the tracking metrics, but for this semester, our Capture the Flag website was open to the public. It's pretty small and it's relatively lightweight, but if we left it up as is for a long time, some real world attack attacker might try to exploit it. So to prevent this, we would want to make a login for students that are really using the application and protect it from other arbitrary users. And then finally, our Google Forms solution for hints was adequate in the small scale that we had, but in the future, we would like to use a different approach. Um, ideally, we would have a hint engine that could hook into the metrics tracking that I mentioned earlier and provide a targeted hint to students. 
Um, so give them just enough information, push them um, past the next vulnerability if they need it. So even though there's still room for improvement, this project gives students and instructors a strong foundation to learn or teach cloud configuration security in a fun, approachable, and engaging way. Hi, it's Matt again, and I'm going to go over the conclusions of our challenge. All teams completed a pre and post questionnaire. This questionnaire was used by our group to measure the learning and fun factor of the challenge. Two teams successfully completed the challenge, and all teams rated their knowledge of cloud computing as much higher, though, after the challenge. They also had fun and would recommend to others. We believe this shows how our challenge helps educate others in the dangers and pitfalls of cloud computing, if not secured. Thank you very much. This concludes this presentation.